Thank you for listening to Gateway City Church Online today. We hope this message will be a blessing to you and draw you closer to God. Now let's go into the service for today's message. Happy birthday, America. You are the land that I love, despite the fact that you're not perfect. You're broken, divided, bleeding. But there's greatness in you, America, because you were founded on the idea that everybody is created equal. And that there is a creator who gives to every person inalienable inalienable rights to pursue happiness and freedom, to prosper. This is the idea that has driven you, America, for 200 years or more. And at times you've fallen and skinned your knees, America, you've let yourself down. But we are optimistic on your birthday, America. We're burdened, but we're optimistic because we're believers. And we know, America, that if God's people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, that God can heal a place like America and make it even greater. America, you're worth the trouble you're worth fighting for because you're a place of freedom. You're a virtue-based free land. We're praying for you, America, today on your birthday that your virtue would rise, that justice would rise, that love would rise, that peace would rise, that prosperity would rise. Happy birthday, America. You are the land that we love and we say, God bless America. Let's be thankful today and give the Lord praise for his goodness in our nation. Amen. We love you, America. We're not giving up on you. Amen. Be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you, worship team. Beautiful job as always. And I'm so grateful to be together with each and every one of you. Good to see some of you I haven't seen in a while. While we're saying happy birthday, maybe I'll say happy birthday to my friend, Pastor Chandler. Where are you, Chandler? You were here a minute ago. There you are. Pastor Chandler, you are 61. Stand up, Chandler, please. 61 years old. Chandler's on our board. I've traveled the world with Chandler. Somos hermanos. And uh, he actually loves Hispanic people more than, no, not really, but um, great people great people. Let's take a teaching outline and uh, 
If you're joining us online, you can get your teaching outline right on the website. And if you're in the cafe, make sure you have one. I hope you've got your heart and soul book. Uh, If you're following along in this series, we're in small groups together and we're kind of celebrating the idea of servanthood. We call it heart and soul because serving is the heart and soul of who Jesus is. Serving is the heart and soul of the church, the body of Christ. Serving is the heart and soul of this house. For as long as I can remember, we've been a ministry-oriented, serving-oriented, action church. A church should be a place where there's action, where people are doing things for each other and for the Lord. And I want to dedicate this message this morning. I want to dedicate it to everyone who is serving, everyone who is praying, everyone who is... uh, ushering everyone who's running sound, pushing a television camera, uh, working in the cafe, everyone who's leading a small group, everyone who's on our board, everyone who's an elder, everyone who's in Cleansing Stream and Gateway Healing Network, and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of great people who are ministering to children and youth and to our beautiful staff that does such a great job in serving and to, and to all, of our, all of our people, all of you, that I appreciate so much. I have met the greatest people of my life in this church. The servants, the people that that show up and, and make the vision work. Teamwork makes the dream work. And the people that 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 take care of other people, the people that get in their car and drive 30 miles to visit a sick person follow up on a discouraged person, pick up a phone and call somebody, follow up on someone who's prayed to receive Christ or discipling new converts over and over and over. I watch it. I watch our team. I watch our leaders. I I watch the people praying here at the front and they serve and they give and they give and they serve and they smile. And sometimes it's tiring and sometimes we forget to say thank you. But I want to thank every person that is serving in this church because you are making this dream come true. And I thank you and I dedicate this message to you. The heart and soul of this church is serving. And I'm excited as our young people, our junior hires and high schoolers are getting ready to start internship this Thursday. Pastor Jordan and April will be taking about 28 or 30 of our young kids and a few kids from our other campuses actually coming in for two weeks of intense discipleship and The heart of it is to learn to serve, to learn that God wants to use their lives. And we've done this for years and years and years now. Hundreds of young people have been through this internship. And if there's one thing that that we want to impress on every Christian and every young person being trained, it's the joy of serving, the joy of not living for yourself, but the joy of actually living for other people. And today I want to talk about serving, but I want to look at it from the standpoint of motive, I want to ask the question which we all need to ask, which is why should we serve? You know, the why is, the why sometimes is almost as important or more important than the what. The what is serving, but the why is why do we do it? Pastor, why do you work in ministry? Those of you that are intercessors or counselors or children's workers or ushers or greeters or TV people or cabinet, why do you do this? Why do our campus pastors do it? Why? What is the reason? And as we drill down into the why, it actually releases life. It actually empowers us in the Holy Spirit to align ourselves with the the calling that Jesus has given to every one of us. Let me read to you from Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 42 through 45. We've sort of been touching on this verse almost weekly for the past several weeks. Pastor Chris did a great job last week talking about that cup of cold water. And next Sunday, Pastor Jordan's going to share the next message in this series. But I want to I read to you from the New Century Version because this one kind of makes it sizzle a little bit. Watch this. It said, Jesus called the 12 together and he said, the other nations have rulers You know that those rulers love to show their power over the people. And their important leaders love to use all their authority. But it should not be that way among you. Whosoever wants to become great among you must what? Serve the rest of you like a servant. Whoever wants to become first among you must, what? 
serve all of you like a, like a slave. Whoa. In the same way, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many, what? People. Say the word people. We're going to talk about the why of ministry and what Jesus is expressing here is that we don't take our cues culturally. Listen, young people, we don't take our inspiration from the, from the world. Jesus was constantly saying, you see how it is out there, but I say to you this. You have heard it said in religious places and by teachers of the law, you have heard it said this, but I say unto you. So Jesus comes with a completely different view. He cuts through the fog that's in the world. And on the issue of ministry and leadership and greatness and being first, he says the heart and soul of it is not power and it's not title. It's all about serving people. Greatness is serving people. Listen to me, pastors. Listen to me, ministers in training, elders, leaders. Greatness is not a matter of title. Greatness is not a matter of where you're standing in this room on Sunday. Greatness is about people, and it's about giving your life to benefit people. That's called love. That's the heart and soul of the gospel. That's the heart and soul of what gives you and I purpose and meaning in our lives. It's okay to do right things, but it's essential to do right things for the right reasons. You've got to have the why correct in your heart and soul if you're going to come to the place that Jesus would say, you're great. You have a great life. I suppose we've all done the right thing for the wrong reason. I can remember when I was about seven years old, I grew up in the East Bay in Castro Valley, and uh, we had a swimming pool, and I had a little brother by the name of Mark. He was two years old. My dad, back in the day, uh, had a phone, but of course, it was connected by a wire to the house. I don't know if any of you would remember that, but he was, on the, he was in the backyard. He was on the phone at the end of the extension, and he was taking care of some, some business, and I was in the backyard uh, swimming. And my little brother was on his tricycle, two or three years old, and he rode that tricycle right off the edge of the, of the patio, right into the pool. And in those days, we had some, we didn't have pampers, we had cotton diapers. I'm not sure if any of you would remember what a cotton diaper is, but you would, you would apply a cotton diaper and you didn't throw it away. It's, it's the most amazing thing. You would wash it. You would wash it. Fold it, dry it, and use it again. Anyway, that was back when Moses was in junior high school. All right. <laughs> and then around that cotton diaper, you had to have plastic uh, panties, right? Pants or pants? pants? Call them panties or pants? pants. Okay, not panties. That's yeah. weird. That just got weird. <laughs> okay. So he had the plastic pants, even though they're shaped like panties. What can I say? I did. <laughs> And uh, so when he went off the edge into the water, his head went straight, the tricycle course went straight to the bottom of the pool, and his head went straight down. But because of those plastic panties, his little bottom was above the surface, and his legs were (laughs) going like this. His head is under the water. I mean, he had, like, this was a serious situation. He was going to, he was going to, just bobbing there, hanging by his pants. And, uh, and so I swam heroically. I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> it was actually slow-mo. It was, uh, it was a, you know. No, I, and I, I swam, and I got him, and I put him up to the side, and my dad decided he should end his phone call and did so, and then came, and then... And then but they, everybody was so excited that I had saved my brother's life, right? I mean... And I sensed my opportunity. I had done something really good. And as a seven or eight-year-old, I knew that good boys get rewards. (laughs) So I started negotiating for 50 cents. And I said, don't you think I should get, you know, like a 
like 50 cents, or I, I think I started at a dollar, my dad got me down to 50 cents, and I got 50 cents for saving my brother's life, so I remind him often that he's worth 50 cents <laughs> to my parents. And, uh, and so how many of you have done something, the, the, you've done the right thing, I'm, I'm sure it's true, you've done the right thing, but maybe didn't have quite the right motive in that. Shouldn't it be, shouldn't it be that we would save a life for nothing? Shouldn't it be that we would do what we do for the Lord just for, for nothing and not look for anything else? But of course, sometimes that happens. And I think what God wants to do is, is, is to refresh us and heal us and align us and adjust us in our heart and soul by reminding us the why. Why do we do what we do? If you lead, why do you lead? If you preach or play your instrument or greet or lead a group or uh, why do you do what you do? Why are you a parent? Why are you, why are you serving your children? These are all questions that I think are so important. I want to draw your attention to Psalm 116, the message translation. Uh, this would have been appropriate for the communion service, but what a beautiful scripture, the message translation says, what can I give back to God for the blessings that he's poured out on me? I'll lift high the cup of salvation. That's the one we drank from today. A toast to God. I'll pray in the name of God. I'll complete what I promised God I'd do. I'll do it together with his people. What is is the psalmist saying? What can I do in response to the goodness of God? God, you've done so much for me. I want to do something. Here's what I'll do. I'll lift high the cup of salvation. I'll not be ashamed of what God has done for me. And I'll make sure that I drink that cup and and I get all of it. A toast to God. I'll celebrate. And then he says, I'll pray in the name of God. That's what I'll do because God's been so good. But he also says, I'll complete what I'd promised God I'd what? Do. If you're looking at that piece of paper, circle that word do because it comes up again. I'll complete what I promised I'd do and I will what? Do it together with God's people. There is something about the gratitude of when God touches you, saves you, heals you, blesses you, redeems you, that it makes you want to do something. And really, if we were to to define ministry or define serving, it's doing something for God. But why do we do it? We do it because of what he's done for us. That's why we do what we do. We do it because God has blessed us, healed us, and helped us, and it just seems like it's right for us to do something for the Lord. In fact, in the New Testament, over and over and over again, when the gospel was preached and the good news was shared and miracles were done, people would fall on their face, fall to their knees, or ask this question, what shall I do? I want to do something To respond to this, the question for many of us today is, what are you doing? But not just what are you doing, but why are you doing it? Let's get the what and the why straight, because serving, here's what I would just drop on everyone that's listening. Serving is rooted in our response to the goodness of God. Why do we do what we do? Why do we play our bass? Why do we usher? Why do we share with our neighbor? Why do we get in a car and drive and visit a sick person or an inmate? Or why do we help someone who's less fortunate? Why do we do that? We do it because of a response to what God has already done for us. And I promise you, if you're a doer, you might get tired sometimes. But if you remember this, you'll have boundless energy. You'll have boundless energy to serve the Lord. You'll have, this will keep you going with your trial and your difficulty and your hardship and the price you're paying to serve the Lord. This one will fuel you. Get your why right. And you'll never doubt in a downtime. You'll never question yourself in a downtime and be unable to answer, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? I do this to respond to the Lord. Why do we serve? Because he served us first. Why do we love God? Because he loved us first. We're responding. Why do we give? Because he already gave. Serving is about a response to Jesus. Everyone say Jesus. 
I'm afraid that in ministry, we make it so complicated. We get all kinds of things tangled up and that's where we lose our joy. If we could just see ministry, if we could just see serving, if we could just see what we do for our neighbor, for our child, for our spouse, if we could see that purely as an act of worship for an audience of one. Jesus, I am doing this for you. If someone notices, that would be great. That's fine. If they don't notice, that's fine. Because I'm doing this for you. This is what keeps you strong in life and keeps you strong in serving. Now, if you're watching this with your small group by way of video, you can take your study guide and dig into that and follow the directions. Have a great group. Let's talk together about getting the why of serving right. Three things I'd like to say this morning to us, and you can write these down in your notes and talk about them in your small group. Number one, we serve because Jesus first served us. He said the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve and to give. Did you know that Jesus has come to serve you? That might sound awkward. Kind of like when Peter said to Jesus, Jesus, no. You're not going to do stuff for me. You can't wash my feet. Lord, I, I want to serve you. You know, it's, it's something that we got to get straight here. He served you before you ever served. He blessed you. He ministered to you. He got down on his knees into your dusty, crackly feet. He got up in your marriage. He got up in your self-esteem issues. Jesus got all into your problems and your sins, and he started washing because he loves you, because he cares about you. I think sometimes we, we forget how much he loves us and how he didn't come to be served. He came to bless. Look, you don't have to be afraid of God. He's here to bless you. He wants to... He, Jesus loves you. He wants to get, let him into your mess. Let him into your dusty feet and your broken heart. Let him in there. Because if you will give him permission to wash you, he will wash you. If you give him access to your heart, he will bless you and restore you. At the end of the service today, I'm going to give you a chance. If you're away from God, I want you to open the door again to him and say, Lord, I'm inviting you in. I want to let you serve me. I want to receive from you everything that you have for me. Because really, that's where it all began. It's when he was serving you and loving you and getting involved in your hurt and your pain. So then you get healed and then you respond and you say, all right, now, what can I do, Lord? How can I, how can I serve somebody else? This is what it's all about. This is the key to a lifetime of uh, joy and pleasure. It's understanding that he wants to serve you and minister to you. Let me ask you this question. How well do you receive from the Lord? Are you a good receiver? This is an important one. Go ahead and put it up on the screen. How well do you receive from God? I remember years ago before Kathy and I were married, uh, we had a breakup. We had two major breakups. The first was her fault. The second one was my fault. <laughs> and I didn't see it coming. We broke up. I was sad. I, I remember, and there was other things going on in my life. I was stressing out. I was carrying 18 units in college, and I was working almost full-time, and leading a small group, and I was redlining. And the breakup just kind of pushed me up. And I, we used to have this prayer chapel. Gary, you remember the prayer chapel at Church of the Crossroads. And I went into that prayer chapel, and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't talk. I didn't have any words. I don't know if you've ever been there. Some of you would be a miracle if you ever got to that point. <laughs> I was out of work. I, I, I didn't know what to say to God. I just sat and I just said to the Lord, can I just be with you? Can I just receive from you? And I, and I put myself in a position 
to let Jesus minister to me when I needed it. And the things that the Lord spoke to me at that time that I'm still seeing come to pass and how the Lord helped me because I allowed him to wash my feet, to love me, to bless me in my broken place. How well do you receive? If you're like many people, you, you'd rather help somebody than receive help from somebody. Sometimes it can be a struggle to learn to receive. But I want you to be good at learning to receive because in the end of the day, you will have nothing to give to anybody else. You will have nothing to give to anyone else if you don't receive well. And you say, I don't have anything for my wife. I don't know what to say to my kids. I don't have... I don't have anything. I don't, I don't have anything to give. What's the problem? You're not receiving. Invite Jesus into the broken place of your life and receive from him and let him begin to pour into you and you will have plenty of love for other people, even if they're imperfect, even if they test your patience, you'll be able to give. Does anybody get anything out of this? Everyone say this, I'm a good receiver. Lord, I'll take whatever you have for me. Not just my feet, but my head and hands also. Amen. Be a good receiver from the Lord. We serve Jesus because he first served us. Number two, we serve because it frees us from selfishness. Oh, I'm coming for you right now. But I'm also coming for myself. We all have that core of selfishness, that self-focus. I said to you before, there's a blessed self-forgetfulness in serving. It helps you to forget yourself and be engaged with what other people are dealing with. Serving is a blessing. Why do we serve? Why do we do? Why do we do what we're doing? We do it because it frees us from selfishness. I have two beautiful sons I'm so proud of and my d- beautiful daughter-in-laws. And, and, uh, and th- my sons took me out for Father's Day, a few days after Father's Day. Dad, we want to buy you dinner. I was, so, I was so great, you know. Okay, it was Taco Bell, but, you know. Uh, no, it wasn't. Took me out. We just started talking. No, it was good. It was Indian food. I love me a good biryani, okay, just a good curry, and it was good. Chicken vindaloo was nice. And so we're talking, I'm talking with my two adult sons, and we're talking now about raising kids, because now they're raising kids, and they're realizing some of the stuff that I went through, and they're kind of like putting two and two together, right? And so we're talking about how this common thing for fathers and mothers and people that give care to children and grandparents and aunties and uncles and whoever cares for the least of these, right, learns to be very unselfish. Raising children breaks you of selfishness, doesn't it? Serving these beautiful little darlings that you just want to, like, some days you want to eBay them, you know? Uh, (laughs) But other days, and and they're like, and my adult sons are now telling me, dad, dad, like we were selfish. And I'm going, hmm. Mm -hmm." But now, and I'm remembering, and I remember the, the, Maybe the first day that Kathy left me alone with our firstborn son, Aaron, for like a day, right? It was long. And I, you know, like I'm good for five minutes, you know, but until something smells, then they go back, right? So, but this was like a whole day. And I, I was, I'm, how old am I? When uh, 1984, I was 23 years old. So I've got this kid for the whole day. And I'm tired. I'm like weary, like waves of exhaustion are coming over me because it's been a long week or whatever. I'm exhausted. I'm sleep deprived like most young parents. And uh, Aaron wasn't sleepy at all. And it was dawning on me that I wasn't going to get to rest, like at all, for the whole day. He was just, and it was breaking my heart. It, it It was like, I'm losing my rights. I'm... I should be able to sleep. I can't sleep. I want to sleep. I need to sleep, but I can't do this. There is nothing like responsibility to cure us of our selfishness. There is nothing like taking the role of a servant 
and being faithful to a job, come what may, to grind down that self-focus that we all suffer from. And I can tell you the greatest way to become like Jesus is to, is to roll up your sleeves and take on some responsibility. Because that's where, especially if it's with other people on a team, that's where you learn all kinds of things about yourself and all kinds of things about other people that you probably didn't want to know. Serving changes us into people that resemble Jesus. Look at Romans 6.22. It says, but now that you have been set free from sin. How many are glad you've been set free from sin? Amen. Now that you've been set free from sin and become, uh-oh. Wait, we gone from one servitude to another servitude. We used to serve sin. We used to be a slave to sin. Now we're slaves to God. Okay, that's different. Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap. The benefit goes to you. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. God will get into your character. He will make you holy. He will make you like Christ, and he will lead you into eternal life by allowing the self part of you to be ground down as you pick up the towel and the bowl, and you get in there heart and soul. You get your why right. But you're not saying, oh, this is making me miserable. I hate this kid. I, I hate this kid. I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. No, you do it because you love him. You got your why right. You're serving out of love. You're serving out of giving. It's not convenient. It's not easy. But you're doing it. And guess what? You didn't die. Actually, you became a better person. And by the time you got to that third child, you just were like, you were just like Christ. I mean, you were just... <laughs> completely like Jesus, because all that selfishness is broken off of you. And all the parents said, good job, moms and dad. Good job, faithful aunties and uncles and big brothers and big sisters. Embracing serving makes you like Jesus. Romans 6.18, the J.B. Phillips translation says, thank God that you who were at one time the servants of sin honestly responded to the impact of Christ's teaching, and then released from the service of sin, you entered into the service of righteousness. Hallelujah. This is what serving is all about. Now, I want to give you a warning. The warning is that as you're being processed through, you know, serving and giving and helping others and taking on responsibility and all that, you'll discover certain attitudes that will crop up in your life that God wants to just scoop off. Four of them are up on the screen, right? We're going to put those up on the screen right now. These four things that kind of, these are brands or versions of selfishness. Believe me, there are many, many more. These are just a few that I've experienced and that I see in our culture today. That, that kind of selfishness called self-entitlement, like you owe me, you owe me. So let's get that straight right now. No, that isn't, that's not servant talk. That's not being a servant. That's completely counter to who Jesus is. I deserve more. You can read about that if you are courageous enough in Matthew chapter 20. Or there's abandonment issues that come up as we serve. As we serve, we, we get angry with God sometimes. Hey, somebody else got favored. Somebody else got promoted. Somebody else got the... How did he get that job? That's the job I wanted. God, you are wrong. You are unjust because you, what about me getting mine? That selfishness that God wants to grind down, the unforgiveness that starts coming up as we serve. God wants to deal with that, the de demanding of people, pay me what you owe me. That is not what it is about. And that place of judgment by comparison where we feel unjustly treated, well, what about that person? I, I got to do this. I have to work hard like this. How come they get off so easy? These are all forms of selfishness, aren't they? And we can paint the prettiest picture and call it all kinds of fancy names. But the bottom line is, it's, it's, a, it's our soul saying, I want mine. 
And Jesus is saying, as you serve, get the heart and soul right, come to a place of purity. Even I didn't come to be served. I didn't come to get mine. I came to give, to give for people. Are you greater than me? So the heart and soul and the thing, and here's what happens. I find that serving frees me from myself. And when I'm free from myself, I get happy. I get optimistic. I get cheerful. When I'm focused on myself, I'm angry at the injustice and the problems and the unfairness and the favoritism. And I start keeping track of all that. And that's where I get angry. Because when you count and you keep track, that is a sure sign that you've lost your why. Let's come back to the why. The why is we do what we do for the Lord, and we win as a result of it. Okay, last one. Are you getting anything out of this today? I'm glad you came today. You got any good plans for the 4th of July? Okay, have fun, but behave yourself. All right. Here's the third piece of this. We serve to fulfill God's purpose. Everyone say purpose. There's a purpose for you. You have a purpose that God gives to you, and he wants to bring you into that place of purpose. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many, what? People. I love serving in ministry because because it helps people. Gives me a purpose in my life. I got a letter not too long ago from a guy who said the following words I've wanted to kill myself every day for 12 years. But after listening to your last message, I've been totally set free. You saved my life. An unlikely person like me, being able to help a person like that with that kind of a problem is addicting. It's, it's my why. And I can tell you that doing ministry, doing leadership, you know this, if you've served or given, I mean, I'm not anybody special. When you're, when you're out there doing what you're doing, there's going to be moments where it's not comfortable, moments where it's not easy, moments where it doesn't feel good, and moments where you'll cry. I think I, I think I cried more this week just over the brokenness of people and situations. And I think more than a long time. The, the timing of this message is pretty amazing, actually, because I'm watching people mess their lives up. I'm watching people fight. I'm watching people break down in their families, and it breaks my heart. And then I guess maybe I've got the, I just added three more kids syndrome because <laughs> we have four campuses now, and I'm at another level of the breaking of the selfishness. And you come back to the why. You come back to the place where you're saying, okay, Jesus, I'm going to stay on this, not, not for this. I'm going to stay on this for you. And when I do that, the joy comes right back. And that's the joy that I, that I want you to have in your life. There's a purpose for your life, and God gives us purpose. The Bible says that we find our purpose. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Go ahead, put that next verse up if you would. Let's see. Each of us finds our meaning and function. Would you like to find your meaning? Each of us finds our meaning and our function as a part of his body. I'm so grateful for the body of Christ. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to serve and help, and I hope you find that joy. I've noticed this. Christian people can get cranky and bored if they lose their sense of God's purpose in their life. It's, it's boring not to have a purpose. It actually gets you cranky. 
I'll close with this story. We're going to pray. And I think I may have told you this story before. The TV guys don't like me to stand here. I apologize. I'm sorry. I want to serve you. You guys ever watch the show, The Dog Whisperer? It's a quirky show. It's on National Geographic Channel. This guy, Cesar Millan, who, who like dog whispers. He, he takes dogs that are crazy and he trains them and redeems them. It's kind of cool. And I'll never forget this one episode where this family called Cesar Millan in a total panic because their German shepherd, probably three or four year old German shepherd, was barking all day long and spinning in furious circles all day long like he was losing his mind. And so they called him and he came and he looked at the dog and the dog was like, I will tear your face off. Don't even come near me. He goes to, he goes back to his Jeep and he gets a doggy backpack a canvas backpack for dogs. He says to the owner, do you have some rocks or some bottles of water or something I can put in this? He says, yeah. They put five bottles of water in this doggy backpack and now it weighs something. And he walks up to this German shepherd that's just snarling, looks like he's demon, is like demon dog. And he walks up to him and he puts this backpack on this dog's back, straps it in, and the dog just goes, "Mm." straightens right up, comes to attention. He clips the leash to the dog, and they start walking. And this dog is walking in pride because he's carrying a load. The owners are freaking out. They can't believe it. what, What are you doing? Why is this working? Cesar Millan says, this dog was bred to work. He's a working breed. And he's bored. And he's losing his mind because he doesn't have purpose. And when you give a dog like this purpose, his life starts to work. I think about that and I think about my own life and maybe maybe somebody here. I'm not calling you a dog. (laughs) But I would ask you, are you bored and cranky? Is your boredom and crankiness a reflection of the fact that you haven't found your slot, your place to give unselfishly? I I encourage you, find your place, find your purpose, and serve. Get your heart and soul right. Take on one more kid. (laughs) It'll do you good. You know, add one more responsibility because it brings you to attention and brings you to that blessed self-forgetfulness that ministry provides, that service provides. How many want to serve the Lord with the right why? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness, Lord, and I pray for all us dogs to find our purpose, Lord. I pray that you would take the boredom, the crankiness, out of us. And Lord, let us live with joy, the joy of serving Jesus, an audience of one. Whether it's appreciated and noticed or not, it's really for us. It cleans us up. It brings us joy. It gives us purpose. Lord, get our why straight again, Lord, and give us the joy of ministry and loving you in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many would say, yeah, I'm wrestling with a little I'm wrestling with a little difficulty in my life and I think part of my answer is I need to find my place and just click in. I've I've somehow lost my somehow lost my assignment and I'm I'm a little bit like that dog going around in circles just kind of frustrated and if that's you you don't have to be ashamed. I'd love to pray for you. If you If you're in that place today and you just want to say, I want to just serve the Lord. I just want to come back to the simplicity of serving Jesus. If that's you, just lift your hand. I want to to just see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Many hands going up. Lord, I just ask that you would 
Restore the joy to all of us, Lord. Thank you, Father. Put your hands down. There's one more group of people I want to talk to before we close. That's those of you who may never have encountered this incredible love of Jesus that washes, that heals, that forgives, that changes. It's simply allowing him into your life. He loves you. He wants to wash your feet. He wants to serve you. He wants to help you with your junk. But you have to, you have to say, Lord, I give you permission to come into my life. I want you in my life. Are you a good receiver? Will you receive Christ today? If that's you and you want prayer and you're away from God and you want to fix that today, you lift your hands, please. Just heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Wherever you are, just lift your hands to the Lord. Pray for me, Pastor David. I want to receive Christ. I want to turn my life over to him. Is there someone here today that will just raise their hand? Say, that's me. Thank you, ma'am. I see you. I see you and I see you and I see you. Thank you. Just respond and just say, yep, yeah, I'll, I'll receive Christ. Father, I pray for these that are raising their hands right now. Every Christian praying with me. Lives are changing today. A new story is being written. Lord, we pray that you just touch these people supernaturally. Free them and deliver them, Lord. Let them know the joy of salvation as they open their heart to Jesus. Come in and give them new life, I pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. It's about six people that raised their hands to open the door of their heart to Christ today. I'm so grateful for that. I'd like you guys to pray with me. In just a minute, we're going to conclude the service. We'll be passing our offering, singing our closing song. I'll come back and speak a blessing over us. So just sit tight for another two minutes. But there's a prayer that we're going to put up on the screen. And I'd like to say before we say that prayer, to those of you that did raise your hand, you're making a decision for Christ. There's a card in front of you that says, I've decided. I would love to get some feedback from you today. I would love to know what you decided to do today. Did you decide to join the church, find a place of ministry? Did you receive Christ? Let me know that decision. Put it in the offering, fill it out. And then also, the, those of you that are new in the church, this is your opportunity um, as the offering container comes by to drop in that card that says, I'm new here. We'd love to welcome you officially, all right? We're grateful for you. Let's all say this prayer. Can we look at the screen and say a sincere prayer to God? Those of you that raised your hands and those that didn't, let's all pray together. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to serve my deepest need. Jesus, by faith, I receive all that you offer me. Help me to truly understand why I am to serve. Deliver me from selfish thinking and living and let my heart flow with your motivation for all I do in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you think that's a good prayer, say amen one more time. Amen. Thank you for your giving, everybody. We're going to go ahead and honor the Lord with our gifts. And let's just allow the Lord to wash us as we worship here for a few more moments. I'll be back in just a minute. Thank you for hope and purpose rising up in us, Jesus. Restore. Your name is life. Let's sing it together. Your name is life. Your name is hope inside me. Hope inside me. Your name is love. A love that always finds. So good. Always finds me. Sing it to him. Your name.
hands raised, we say, Lord, to you be the glory and the honor. For you are worthy. Thank you for washing, cleansing, and releasing us, Lord. In Jesus' name, let your grace rest on your people, Father. Amen. Well, that's the blessing. And Jordan, I wanted you just to mention, I'm sorry, I, I blessed and I was going to have you blessed, but the blessing just came out of me. I couldn't stop myself. <laughs> so my people, I love them. I just couldn't resist it. You guys are irresistible. I'll try to let it go. All right. What's, what are we, <laughs> what's happening with parents of high schoolers? Uh, so just a reminder for our new interns and returning interns and their parents in about 15 minutes. At about 10 minutes, actually, we are meeting in the Reality Center for the info meeting. So we will see you guys over there in 10 minutes. Amen. New and returning interns and their right. parents. God bless you guys. I hope you have an amazing week. Rest, be refreshed, love each other, be good to each other, and don't say things you're not supposed to say. <laughs> be, just, just, just don't say things you're not supposed to say. Be good to one another. Okay, love you. God bless you.